I thought we'd spend some time this morning and finish the Pulaski project so I can get a handle on this and get it delivered. It's just almost done. The majority of the forging is done, but the eye needs a little bit of cleaning and straightening. It's a little crooked in a few places. So I'm going to bring it back up to heat, do some fairly aggressive drifting to try and get that all cleaned out, and then do the final shape on this ads section and make it look more like the one I'm using as a sample. Do you believe it? It's mid-August and I'm back to a flannel shirt because it's nice and cool and chilly this morning. Kind of like it, but I'll bet you it heats up real nice when I get that chili forge going. So let's go get that hot. Let's get this hot and let's get to work. Of course, my goal is to try and get rid of the thin, uh, the fat spots without making it too thin everywhere else. Drifting it from the top is a little bit tougher because I don't have a good support for it. So I'm going to do more of these. I will make a support. It's just a matter of fussing and fiddling with it till I get these thin spots out of there. Some of this may get filed a little bit. But it's certainly looking better. When I'm drifting from the bottom, I can use this support. But the blade is in the way if I try to drift from the top in that. I'm going to thin out the ears just a little bit more. And it pays to keep checking and see what it needs. Remember, this is all mild steel up in here. It's just tool steel at the uh, cutting edge. So I'm not going to hurt the tool steel working this just a little bit cold.
adds blade sticking off to the side, it does make it a little bit weird to work sometimes. You got to make sure it's off the anvil so you don't squish it. I think I'm about done with everything I can do there. About down to making sure it's all straight. I just want to give that adz blade a gentle curve so it swings a little bit smoother in use. Make sure it's straight in that dimension. And this is pretty easy to just kind of lift up on it as you work down on the anvil. That may be a bit much. I'm pretty happy with that. I think that is the last forging step for this. There'll be some grinding and filing and cleaning up. The eye is more centered than it was, but I'll need to get into this space right here and file that a little bit. Just a little cleaning up on the inside of the eye with a file to Take some of the lumps and bumps out really makes a big difference. With the eye much more even, it's time to do the final grinding. Well, that's been ground down to a 220 finish in the areas that needed a little touch up. Even though it looked like I was sharpening it, I just take a little off to make it easier later, but it's very blunt until after the hardening and tempering stage. So now into the hardening oven. Yes, it's going to rain again this afternoon. I'm going to take this to 1200 degrees for a 20 minute soak. Then we're going to bring it up to 1550 because it's 5160 and that's the right temperature for that. And let it soak for another 20 minutes. And now we are off and running. Well, we're almost up to heat in the little Paragon furnace here. And let me show you what's going to have to happen. This is a little bit tricky because I need to harden both ends and my bucket of oil is not deep enough to get it all the way in there and completely submerge it. So I'm going to have to quickly alternate back and forth and try to get both ends to cool relatively quickly. This isn't ideal in most situations because every time you pull it out, this is gonna heat back up again from the body of the tool. But for this tool, because it's a heavy work tool, it needs to be fairly tough and an absolute razor sharp cutting edge probably isn't as important. That little bit of loss of hardness by doing it this way is probably actually a good thing. And when I temper it, I'm going to temper it back further anyways. So I think this is going to work okay. This is the way I've had to do double bit axes and things like that in the past. So it's just sort of the routine you have to go through. But I think this is up to heat, so we're about ready to start. tongs doesn't fit the one I'm working on as well as it fit the one I was using as a sample. A little bit of a problem but not a big one. This is why you don't put quenching oil in a plastic bucket. Doesn't hurt anything at all in the metal bucket. 
it's not real good for the quenching oil to burn it, but That's cooling off quite well. Of course, the fire does affect it a little bit. But when we're all done, we'll test it with a file and see what we got. Well, I'm going to go on faith that my ends have cooled off sufficiently that if I now quench this in water, I am not going to shock it too much. That is, of course, a risk because 5160 is not water quenching. skates across the ads end, so it's harder than it needs to be in the long run, and skates across the cutting edge. So let's go temper this now, and initially I'm going to do that in this little toaster oven. It only goes up to 450, and I'm going to want this a little bit hotter than that in the long run, but it just barely fits in there. So I'm going to leave it in there for an hour. Now, ultimately, I'm going to temper that at 500 degrees, but this initial tempering in the toaster oven will be a good de-stress cycle. It'll partially temper it, and it's tempered well enough for a lot of uses, but again, this is a real heavy use tool, and it can be abused, and I would rather have it a little soft so that it goes dull a little faster than to have the edge chip if you accidentally hit a rock while you're using it. So we're going to do that initial tempering that will allow the heat treat oven to cool down overnight and then I can use it to come up to 500 degrees tomorrow. I could take it in the house and put it in the oven at 500 but the double tempering is probably a good idea anyways. So we're going to go ahead and do that. Um, I'm going to call it a day. We will pick this video up again in just a few seconds for you, but it'll be tomorrow morning for me. We will clean that up, sharpen it, and hopefully get a handle on it before the end of this video, and then that project will be done. I know this has not been a real tutorial type project, not a how-to. I'm just letting you kind of see what I'm going through to, to make this, and I know that I probably could have provided better narration as I went, and maybe we'll do another one one of these days. We'll see. Anyways, stick around. Just a few seconds from now, we'll be right back, and we will see what happened after we got done tempering this. See, I told you that wouldn't take too long. Welcome back. It's the next day. Another nice, cool morning here in Beulah. Still hard to believe that it's August and I'm wearing a flannel shirt. But we had it up to 90 degrees in the shop yesterday, so it'll warm up fast. Our Pulaski project sat in the toaster oven for an hour and I just let it cool off with the toaster oven and called it a day at that point. But I want to temper it a little bit more. I want to make it just a little tougher, which means slightly less hard. And it will not hold an edge as well, but it'll also be easier to sharpen in the field with a file and you won't have to take it to a grinder, use power tools to sharpen it. To do that, I want to heat it to 500 for another hour. But this oven won't do that. I had to wait for this oven to cool down to be able to manage that. This says it's actually 59 degrees in here today. So I've got this set to come up to 500 degrees and hold for one hour. And that should do just what I want it to do. Well, it's been an hour in the oven, a little bit of time cooling down, but before it's completely cool, I want to put a little beeswax on this. And the beeswax helps protect it, help keep it from rusting if it's out in the field and in damp weather or something. But it also gives it a very nice, even black color that I really like. And one reason for the beeswax instead of my usual Johnson's paste wax is just because it's so easy to rub this big block of beeswax all over this than to try and paint something this big with it brush I use for the paste wax. So, 
Now I'm going to let this cool till I can handle it. And we'll do any last touch up on the grinder and sharpen it. The next task then is to do a final light grinding to clean up any profile issues, although there's not going to be much to clean up, and then to put the bevels on. And I can do this on the higher speed grinder because I'll use a nice fresh sharp belt. This is fairly heavy and the serrated wheel also helps dissipate some heat. As I get closer to the final edge, I'll switch to the slower grinder so I don't overheat it. But we're going to get started on this grinder and see what we can do. Of course, don't forget your dust mask and your hearing protection. Now let's switch over to the slower speed grinder with a 220 belt and this is just almost ready to be sharp. We'll raise a burr and get it sharp with this belt, take it on up to a thousand grit, polish the edge and that will be done. Typically when I make axes and adzes, they're for woodworking, wood carving, things like that, and they have a flat bevel that is relatively thin, about 25 degrees, and it makes a very good cutting edge, but it is not a real durable cutting edge. For this, I want something more durable, more abusable, so I'm more like 35 degrees on the axe side of it, and it's a convex grind so it isn't flat it kind of bulges out on the sides a little bit and that's a better supported edge and it'll take more abuse would not be good for woodworking but excellent for chopping trees and then i'm a little blunter on the ads end because it may end up in the dirt and it's really going to get abused so i make that closer to a 45 degree angle and it's more for chopping roots and things like that so the next step Hit this up on the buffer real quick, get the edge polished, and this part is done. Well, there we have a completely forged and sharpened Pulaski head, but it's not much use without a handle. So the next thing we need to do is go put a handle on it. And for that, I have a commercially made double bit axe handle. This particular handle comes from House Handle Company in Missouri. I like buying from them because they give me the option to buy it without the varnish and I just don't like the varnish on axe handles and hammer handles. I always end up sanding it off. This way I don't have to do that. These come with a wooden wedge and a steel wedge. We'll see if it's what I use. Oftentimes they're a little undersized and I prefer one that fills up the whole space. Lots of tools waiting to be handled around here. But we'll just worry about this one for now. And I made my drift, when I made the drift, to fit this handle, or this style of handle. And boy, that's pretty close.
Well, I couldn't ask for much better than that for the initial fit up. But boy, that's just almost tight enough. I'm gonna need something to drop it out with. Scrap of wood sometimes works for this. You need a scrap of wood that's longer. There we go. So I can look and you can see where this starts to bind and I'll go do a little trimming there. I already know all this actually fits, so I just want to trim the spots where it's hanging up and isn't quite going all the way up. So I don't need to trim clear out to here. And also smooth up some of the rough marks from the original manufacturing process. Spoke shave is good for this. If it needs a lot, I'll use a draw knife. But spoke shave is a little bit more controlled. Let's go see if that fits. I'm very happy with the way that fits up. I just need to make my wedge fit. And it's almost good. I'm just going to trim this with a knife and make a taper so it'll wedge in tight both directions. Again, this isn't meant to be a, a how-to instructional. I'm just showing you what I'm up to on this project. We've talked about doing handles before and we'll talk about handles again. I like to put a little glue on the wooden wedges, put a little bit down in the saw kerf. Get the wedge started. Put a little bit more glue on the the wedge here. And that glue, besides helping keep the wedge in place later so it can't slip out over the years, also lubricates it a little bit so it goes in a little bit easier right now. I think I'll put that little anvil on the floor to do that. And that, as they say, is pretty much that. I'm going to let the glue dry for a little bit. Then I'm going to trim that off, give it a final sanding, and then we can put some oil on it. I'm going to sand the saw marks off of the top of this just so it looks cleaner. Put just a little bit of a bevel around the edge. I like this sticking up proud. It just to me looks better. A lot of people like them cut flush. You can do it either way. And then I'll put a little bit of oil on it and it'll be done. But the oil will need to dry overnight so I think we're going to call this project complete right here and this will be ready to go to its new owner tomorrow sometime. I hope you enjoyed watching that. Again, I know it was not a how-to tutorial throughout the entire process, 
but you got to see almost everything that went into making the Pulaski. And someday we will do a similar large tool as a step-by-step -step and explain the whole thing through the entire process. I do hope you enjoyed this video. Give it a thumbs up if you liked it. If you haven't already, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you know what videos we're doing in the future. In the meantime, do get out to your shop and make something. Whether it's something this big or something smaller and more simple, it doesn't matter. Just spend some time in the shop working. But do it safely, wear your safety glasses, and we'll see you for the next one. Yeah. If you would like to provide financial support for the videos here at Black Bear Forge, you may do so by following the links down in the description to either Patreon or PayPal. Those are simply donations. The content will remain free. Thank you.